All right. Um, so I'm going to speak on, I'm going to give an overview of obesity and bariatric nutrition. And I have to give you uh, three important caveats. As other people have said, you could spend five hours to cover all the different parts, to cover obesity, the genetics of obesity, um, drive, drivers of hunger um, and satiety, to cover metabolic syndrome with NASH, in addition to covering bariatric nutrition. And this is all going to be covered in 30 minutes. Um, so again, the goal of this will be to provide an overview of the pathophysiology, genetics, and medical complications associated with the development of obesity during childhood, um, to give an outline of the major procedures that are currently done and the general potential nutritional risks. And I will mention, although I don't have these in slides, a couple, at least one thing that's done overseas that's not approved in the U.S. that maybe eventually will come back and might be of use to us. And also to provide an overview of the most common micronutrient deficiencies that are associated with bariatric procedures, but also probably have a role in the, the pediatric patients we see at large, but we just don't think about them. Um, and then also to review some treatment strategies. Move this down because I am shorter, I think, than most of the people that are talking, except maybe Maria, sorry. Okay, so this has been covered, I think, before, but it's important to keep in mind because whenever you see a child who is overweight, the first thing that the family says is that they don't eat very much and they're very active. And unfortunately, we cannot change the laws of physics. Um, the components of daily energy expenditure are fixed. Whoops, I just went, oh, I went the other way, okay. That's something you can fix, you can click faster or slower. Um, there is a fixed amount of calories that are dedicated to the thermic effect of feeding that's allocated into consuming the food, burning the calories, as well as an increase in sympathetic nervous system activity around the time that the gut is perfused. And you can see that that's relatively the same whether you're sedentary or physically active. Uh, red and resting energy expenditure, if you actually do the math, that's relatively about the same amount of calories, uh, whether you're physically active or sedentary. Now, the larger the mass of the individual, the higher the absolute number of calories that are going to be burned to maintain that amount of um, mass. The only thing that's really able to be um, changed or manipulated is the energy expenditure of physical activity. And I know I did see at least one of the, f uh, the fellows in the audience in the gym this morning when I came down about 5.30. I won't say who it is, but there was at least somebody down there trying to actually manipulate their energy expenditure of physical activity. And this can be either going to the gym, doing aerobic activity, actually lifting weights, or there are a few people in the audience who are fidgeting. You know, and there are some genetic predispositions actually to non-exercise or activity-induced thermogenesis or NEAT. And that's actually the physical activity that's burned by people that are fidgeting. And Dr. Schulman in the back is actually a very good fidgeter. So if, there have actually been studies funded by the NIH to try to figure out what the tendencies are that promote NEAT, which would be a NEAT idea, if we could teach a lot of people who are overweight to be better fidgeters. No, it's true. I mean, you know, if, if you actually, when you see patients that are, are heavier in the office, you also can kind of see a lot of them are not the type of patient that has irritable bowel syndrome. That, you know, the child is sitting there and the parent and, you know, both the child and the parent are very anxious, they're worried, you know, the child has functional abdominal pain. Children that tend to be overweight tend to be relatively calm. You know, they're, they're not, well, there, there is a difference actually in fidgeting. All right, we're gonna move to the next slide. Okay, enough on that. And again, we can't change the laws of physics. So it's important to keep in mind that obesity results from a positive energy balance. You know, and unfortunately, even though our economy likes to make money out of nothing, you know, that, you know, there has to be a balance in energy in and calories that are burned. If you actually consume as much over the year of about, as about 3,500 extra calories, or if you do that in terms of Reese cups, that's 180 Reese cups or about 20 over the year, that will equate to about a pound of fat. There have been some very good genetic studies. A lot of them have been done by the Pennington Institute in, New in uh, Louisiana and Shreveport that was funded by tax dollars, but it's done some good research. One of their best ones was actually in 1990 in the New England Journal where they actually looked at a bunch of monozygotic Scandinavian twins. And they actually followed them over time, and, and they actually, these twins, a subset of them, were overfed 1,000 calories a day for a year. And they actually found that there was a variation in the rate of weight gain um, across the sets of twins, but when you actually looked at the monozygotic twins, the rate of weight gain over that year was actually about the same. And the thought was, at that time, it was all attributed to NEAT. 
their non-energy, because they controlled for the amount of physical activity that was reported. They knew exactly how many calories they were getting in in a day. Um, there was a thought that that may be it. But I think there actually may be another aspect to that that could be a sixth hour of talking about the gut microbiome that we're not talking about that today. Um, so in a nutshell, obesity results from um, a change in energy balance. Now, if we actually... Just again, to give an overview, it's important to keep in mind that there are a variety of different gut peptides that actually will influence food intake, including glucose itself, that will either have a negative feedback or a positive feedback to the brain and the hypothalamus and either the ventromedial or arcuate nuclei that will either stimulate centrally food intake or inhibit food intake. The, there are a number of different messengers coming from either the gut itself through the vagus nerve um, through um, intestines, through the antrum with ghrelin, and through the small intestines, from the pancreas, from fat in the small intestines, uh, from adipose tissue, as well as from cortisol, that will actually help to tightly control energy balance. There are a variety of different external factors that we always have to keep in mind that as early as about two to about six years of age will influence our ability to either stimulate more food intake, you don't really see a lot of kids jumping at McDonald's to get a, a plate of green beans if they serve those with their hamburger. Um, as well as the characteristics of food, the atmosphere, uh, lifestyle behaviors, and environmental cues that will actually allow you to, to overeat the cycle. The, comp the comp composition of food itself can also influence your ability to eat, uh, such that if the food is more palatable, depending on how it's engineered, it may actually also influence the balance between hunger and satiety and allow you to overeat. The, as we move from looking at genetics, you know, um, the, the physiology, the regulation of peptides, into looking and assessing the patient fully, it's important to keep in mind a variety of different medical complications of obesity. As GI doctors, we typically only focus on these things that are in dark green. We think about pancreatitis, and I think everyone in the audience has seen at least one patient that's come in with pancreatic necrosis. Any, everybody? You've, you've seen somebody that's come in like that. We all see patients that come in with gallbladder disease, and we you know, have been very focused on looking at NAFLD and NASH. But when you're looking at the patient, it's very important to start from the top and keep in mind these patients can sometimes develop uh, pseudotumor cerebri, which causes loss of visual fields. They can develop strokes and cataracts even in childhood. They can develop sleep apnea and may not be reporting snoring, but may just have ADHD symptoms. They can develop myocardial infarctions in childhood. They can have diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. In addition to having PCOS, can develop cancers, what were usually thought to be in the 40s and 50s, but I suspect we'll start seeing those in the 20s and 30s, in addition to developing gout and hyperuricemia, acanthosis, as well as phlebitis. So it's, it's very important as you're assessing the patient to not just look at the liver enzymes and the cholesterol and noticing that their patient may have some elevation of blood pressure and hyperlipidemia, but to think about the patient as a whole. Again, I, this would be an hour talk, so I just want to make sure and highlight, I think the key thing here is to make sure and keep all these in mind. As pediatricians, it's very important to keep in mind organic causes of obesity when you're assessing the patient. You want to think about, could this patient have a somatic dysmorphic syndrome? Do they have a history of a CNS insult? Do they have some features of endocrinopathy? Because these may be somebody that has more than the garden variety metabolic syndrome. To take away from this, I do have a slide here that covers the genetic dis disorders associated with childhood obesity. And I wanted to point out a few things. Now, I am short, but, but the patients that typically have genetic disorders, aside from um, a melanocortin receptor, receptor mutation, are generally short for the degree of obesity. They tend to have actually some degree of digital abnormalities, either brachydactyly or polydactyly, or they'll have syndactyly, and that's actually because in utero, there are problems with insulin resistance and signaling that can cause problems in the eye as well as digit formation. And that's why that, that happens. So if you see these things that I've highlighted in yellow, and you won't see these in most patients, but it's important to keep in mind that if you have a kid who's short who may be a little bit cognitively impaired, to make sure you get a good look at the hands and the feet. Because if you do see those there, 
you can make a diagnosis of one of these genetic disorders. So if you make the diagnosis, who cares? But it could be very important for this, this child and family to know because this could be somebody that's going to develop retinitis pigmentosa, may need to be aggressively watched for the development of early onset diabetes, which might not have been picked up otherwise. And anybody who's here knows that I have an interest in prader willi syndrome. So I'm going to also mention that not every child with prader willi syndrome is picked up within the first six months of life. Um, I've actually seen one recently who had a mid-gut volvulus who was eight years old and who was obese. Yeah. But again, I think the take home from this slide is just to keep in mind the red flags for what might a genetic disorder of obesity look like and how they might present. So that if somebody comes into your office or if you hear about it, it could be somebody that has one of these. Now, I'm, again, this is a lot in a short period of time. Now I'm going to talk about the principles of bariatric procedures. The pr principles include creation of a small stomach or causing actually some degree of malabsorption, either through bypass of the proximal small bowel or through bypass more extensively through the small bowel. Both of these probably with a bypass cause either malabsorption or I speculate some of it's actually causing an alteration in bacterial flora that actually may be causing some of the malabsorption and some improvement in features of metabolic syndrome. So you can have one of these by itself, you can just do a bypass, you can have a combination of both. When you're looking at the patients actually, this is probably an important slide to keep in mind for every one of the disorders that we've talked about today. This is actually kind of the roadmap for where all the micronutrients are absorbed. And you need to think about that with the obese patients and the bariatric patients, in addition to the patients with IBD, patients with uh, short bowel syndrome, knowing that if, if there is a problem with the stomach, the uh, micronutrients that are going to be involved include intrinsic factor, copper, iodine, fluoride, and water. In the duodenum, the key factors here would be, again, calcium and iron, in addition to copper. You can see the B vitamins are absorbed in the duodenum, as well as some of the fat solubles. Jejunum, again, you see a lot of the key micronutrients. And then the ileum, we all remember B12, but it's important to keep in mind even vitamin C is absorbed in the ileum. And the reference for that is actually down here. This is a wonderful review, but this is actually the table from there, and I would probably keep that somewhere where you, it's in your slides, so that would be something you want to just kind of keep out to keep in mind when you're assessing a patient, you're thinking about what you should be looking for. All right, so we talk about the different types of bariatric procedures. Let's make the stomach small. Now, in the US, we have two ways to do that. We can fillet the stomach um, and cause a sleeve gastrectomy, or we can do an adjustable gastric band, which actually involves you know, having a saline pouch on the outside and a different amount of restriction. Overseas, they actually also use a, a balloon. Has anybody heard about the bib balloon? Yeah, um, the bib balloon actually is something that is not available in the US. It's actually where you, instead of extrinsically, whoops, sorry, instead of uh, restricting the stomach from the outside, you actually just put, essentially like the Sang Stank and Blakemore tube, you just fill the stomach up with a water balloon. So it's a way that you can create fullness without doing a procedure. In the US, there were a few, as you can imagine, anybody that's seen a patient with a MIC tube or you've seen that the balloon migrate, there were a few migrations in the US when they were first started that caused some duodenal hematomas, so it was pulled from the market but it's been used extensively over in Europe with very good results as a bridge for either somebody that can maybe make it on their own with weight loss or for somebody that eventually is going to need a procedure but it's not appropriate at that time. As we move through the procedures, I'll focus on each one and then talk about what are the common, what the weight loss is, what the issues are, and what the deficiencies are that are commonly seen. Uh, with the band, the weight loss is about 30 to 50% of excess weight. Again, the, the guide here is to restrict so you're not getting that ghrelin feedback. Okay, ghrelin is in there, it tells you I'm full. Here you're getting full quicker. But unfortunately, if you're somebody that likes to snack, if you're a snacker that never distends all at once, you're not gonna really be fixing that, that signal. So if you're a nibbler who likes to drink, drink sweet drinks, you're gonna probably be somebody with a band that only loses 10 or 20% of their excess calories because you, that's not the way you eat. And the key with this would be you have to adjust the restriction. Just like with a kid that has a peg, you, you put the little, the little uh, spacers in to adjust for weight. With this, you're trying to adjust the amount of restriction, so it's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You know, this was too hot, this was too cold, you wanna give them just enough so they don't go to the buffet anymore, and that maybe they dump, or they feel bad when they try to, but you don't want it to be too tight where you're actually restricting the esophagus. The deficiencies associated with having a band would be what you'd expect. 
You would expect to have some iron deficiency, because again, we're not going to have full amount of acid suppression because they probably are getting a little bit. Uh, and the iron is reduced from ferrous to ferric to be absorbed in the stomach. And vitamin D deficiency likely from diet is the second most likely deficiency with this. The beauty of this is at least it is a foreign body, but you can loosen it for somebody that's not being very compliant. With the sleeve, this is a more permanent type of restriction of the stomach. It's actually part of the ruin Y. And with this, you actually have a more fixed amount of restriction. So you would expect that the weight loss would be better. At, it's about four years in adults, 72%, and 55% at six years. Any idea why it might be a little bit less when you look a little further out? What do you think happens to the sleeve? Pardon? Exactly. They, it accommodates to, to the uh, patient. So uh, deficiencies associated with the sleeve include anemia, um, most prominently iron, followed by folate, followed by B12. And again, remember here you're losing part of the antrum and you're losing intrinsic factor. Um, vitamin D deficiency, hypoalbuminemia, and then you can wind up having thiamine deficiency uh, depending on how compliant they are with diet and with, with intake. And again, that's about 10%. Now, if you move from the sleeve plus malabsorption, which would be what you're getting with the ruin Y gastric bypass, the stomach becomes small, and you're bypassing a fair amount of the small bowel, but you're still leaving continuity with the duodenum as well as the pancreatic, uh, pancreatic duct. With this, the weight loss is about 60 to 70 percent, and I think people are familiar with the long-term data that came out of Scandinavia. Everybody's seen that study? The SOS study was published about three years ago in JAMA. With this, there is good long-term weight loss. There are more nutritional issues because you are restricting the stomach plus malabsorbing. Iron deficiency is most common, about half the patients by two years. B12 is second most common. Again, you're losing access with this part of the stomach, about 30% at one to nine years, and this can be very hard to pick up, and D deficiency is common. Dumping is about 40 to 60%, but you can see what you're dealing with as far as stomach size. Uh, this, I've only see, seen this done in one pediatric patient. Did anybody ever, did anybody see the, uh, the show on one of the health channels, Think Discovery Health? There was a kid from uh, Tennessee that had this done. Um, this is rarely done in adolescents because you can see you've got a small stomach and you're bypassing a large amount of the small bowel. So you're going to have a lot of malabsorption. Uh, there, it's done more extensively in Europe. I think there's been at least 30 or 40 adolescents who've had it done, including a kid at eight years of age. Um, excess weight loss is about 82% at 10 years. Uh, there's about, with that much bypass, you're, you're malabsorbing about 75% of the fat and about 25% of the protein. There isn't any carbohydrate malabsorption. Um, so you can expect that there'd be a lot more malnutrition in addition to multiple vitamin and mineral deficiencies. If you think back to that slide where I showed you the roadmap, look how much of the roadmap that you're actually missing. So if we move from this, we've talked very briefly in kind of a whirlwind, physiology, gut peptides, looking at the genetics, and looking at the surgeries, and now to be the detective to look at the deficiencies in bariatric surgery, I think the key is to have a high index of suspicion. For thiamine deficiency, uh, the symptoms that your patient may have may be very subtle. They may just complain that their feet hurt. Uh, they may have uh, reports some numbness and tingling in their feet. Um, they may have had some persistent emesis, and these would be people that were not the most compliant before they had the procedure. They were carb lovers. Thiamine is absorbed in the jejunum and the upper small bowel, and um, it's absorbed in a low amount through active transport through a carrier, and higher amounts actually absorbed passively. So if you were somebody that went in a high-carb diet, not getting a lot of sources of thiamine, and you had these procedures done, and you're not being very compliant with the, what you have to take afterwards, and you've gone back to your carb living, what have we created? We've created refeeding syndrome. And when they come in the hospital, if they're vomiting, what do you do? You hang D10 or D5 half normal saline. What's going to happen to them? They're not going to do very well. So I think the red flag here to think about it would be somebody that has kind of some vague symptoms with persistent emesis. This can pr proceed on to Wernicke's encephalopathy, which we don't typically see in pediatrics, but the series that came out of Cincinnati did report a few patients that had this with um, ophthalmoplegia, nystagmus, ptosis, and diplopia, because thiamine is actually required for the axons and for myelin sheaths. 
in addition to development of peripheral neuropathy and some alteration of mental status, which just may, may present for a teenager that's a little bit confused. For thiamine deficiency, it's very important if, you're going to, if you have any suspicion of it to give dextrose with thiamine um, and to give them a high dose of a B1 with the other B complex vitamins and then to give initially IM or IV for the first part or if they have protracted vomiting. If we move from thiamine to B12, B12 again it can be very subtle. We all think about looking for the macrocytic anemia but a patient actually may just come in and tell you that I have some numbness and tingling in my extremities. They might have the macrocytic anemia, they may not. Um, about half of the patients that have symptoms of deficiency will have normal B12 levels. I think that's really important to keep in mind. And that um, you probably should look at using methylmalonic acid and homocysteine to screen for it. And again, I think the key here is these are vague symptoms. We have a lot of people that come in that really don't report a lot. And you'd have a higher index of suspicion with these vague symptoms if they have been the most compliant. And this is where you want to be the dietary detective. Folic acid. Um, again, the deficiencies here mainly are because you're not taking in enough. You're not being compliant with supplements, you're malabsorbing, and you're also on medicines that can cause deficiency. Uh, the biggest ones that we would use would be methotrexate or sulfasalazine. Again, symptoms here are vague. You have fatigue, weakness, headaches, palpitations, diarrhea. How many of the patients that come in and that we see have those type of IBS type symptoms? But they may also complain that their tongue's bothering them. And it takes a long time to see that beautiful picture of the tongue that's always on the exam. And again, here, um, the best way to assess for this is to look at a homocysteine level and to get an RBC folate, not just, just to measure the serum folate. Because oftentimes, somebody that's had bowel resection or has short bowel, they may have high serum folate levels because of bacterial overgrowth. And treatment here is supplementation. Uh, calcium and vitamin D, the one th this has been hit on over and over and over again, but I wanted to point something out that I think is really important. Um, to either with using RPPIs or if you've had a gastric resection, the low acid results in poor absorption of calcium carbonate, which the first thing we usually do is go for Tums. They're easy to find. Calcium citrate is actually absorbed about 25% better than carbohydrate, regardless of meal status. And actually in a series of patients that had a sleeve gastrectomy, 65% um, of the patients were taking Tums and a multivitamin. A third of those had vitamin D deficiency and an increased PTH. And I think the key here is if we have people on a high dose PPI, especially if the gastrin level is high, that calcium carbonate is probably not a good option. We should probably be looking at citrate. Copper deficiency uh, has been mentioned with looking for sideroblastic anemia and neutropenia. This, fortunately, there's only been about three or four cases in pediatrics, but there probably are others that nobody has ever has really looked for because, again, the symptoms are relatively vague, and it may be that by the time they had neutropenia and it was a, if it was a young child that had copper deficiency, they weren't walking around and they couldn't tell us I had numbness and tingling in my fingers. Symptoms of copper deficiency are numbness, tingling, tingling of the hands and finger, fingers, a gait disturbance with a sway back. I don't, I'm not, probably not doing that very well. I probably look like I'm doing a bad lumbata. Um, in addition to anemia. And the anemia is classically sideroblastic anemia uh, because there's actually competition with copper with iron uh, that causes a change in red cells. Treatment here is with copper supplementation. Okay, I have a couple of cases. The first case, and these are both poll questions. I want to make sure people are awake. Everybody still awake? Okay, good. All right, so we have a four-year-old. His name is Jose. The other kid is not named Jose B. Um, who has a history of mild developmental delay. He was referred by his PCP for mildly elevated liver enzymes. There's a strong family history of diabetes, not surprising. Several of his aunts are legally blind. On physical exam, he has a BMI, he's four of 35, has moderate acanthosis, and has some hepatomegaly. Okay, now I think I have to wait for the polling question. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back. Uh, keep in mind, he's got mild developmental delay um, and is referred in for this. All right, so what is the most appropriate uh, next step for this patient? I want you to move from your GI hat. I'm going to tell you that he's had elevated liver enzymes for six months, but I want you to think about this and, and flip to you. You have nutrition and GI. Oh, oh, we got one person. Okay, let's see. All right. Okay, let's see if we can get up to 16. Okay, we got six. Oh, we're up to 11. There's no controversy here. Okay. 
All right, okay. I guess it's probably easy because I, I kind of gave away. Um, oh, okay, thank you. Oh, that's good. Okay, all right, gold star. <laughs> and it, I guess you know, somebody could say this was a loaded question because there's not the option to do both. So this patient actually on physical, on physical exam had one, two, three, four, five, six. Has six fingers. You can't really tell that much here. The first, one of them had been taken off as an infant and actually went to go get an eye exam. And on eye exam, you can see here's the retina. You can see there's some accumulation of things out in the retina. He actually has Bardet beetle. So this is where, you know, again, how many of these people are you going to see? Probably not that many. But I think it's really important if you're seeing a kid that we would just typically use our typical GI hat, you're going to flip in there, walk in there. The kid's got acanthosis, fine. He's Hispanic, fine. Uh, he's got elevated liver enzymes. Yeah, they're in the 60s to 80s. And the first thing I'm going to be thinking is, you know, do I need to send him to see Rohit? You know, do, do I need to think about putting him on vitamin E? You know, when you should also, you know, take a good look at the patient and make sure you're looking at all the physical findings. And there's, there was actually a nice paper that came out in Nature Gen Genetics that talks about Bardet beetle. I was going to put a picture up there, but I couldn't because it's, I don't have approval to show it. But with Bardet beetle syndrome, what happens is there is actually the Bardet beetle protein actually affects ciliary development. So it leads to early onset diabetes through insulin resistance and leptin resistance. And it also causes the digits to be abnormal, as well as the retinal findings. OK, so gold star for that one. I'm not helping on the next one. OK, case two. We have a 17-year-old girl who had a ruin Y gastric bypass uh, two years ago. She has arm pain. She has back pain. She's weak. She's falling. She was a gold star for her program the first year. OMG, she lost 87% of her excess body weight during year one. Her goal was really only to use about 60%. She is complaining of some stomach cramping. She does have some nausea when she eats protein-rich foods. She had been referred by her PCP to a neurologist and has been diagnosed with a peripheral neuropathy. She's had lab work so far through her PCP that showed anemia with iron studies that were suggestive of iron deficiency. OK so far? All right. OK, here's the next one. OK, of the following choices, what are the things you want to consider as potential nutritional deficiencies? And we've got a lot up there. So we've got vitamin E, we've got B12, we've got thiamine, we've got copper, we've got EM thiamine, we've got B12 and copper, we've got all of the above. OK, we are up to four. We're up to nine. OK, we've got a little bit of shifting here in the audience. OK, we're up to 14. OK. Oh, oh my god, we're getting a lot of responses now. We're up to 19. I haven't seen 19 before. OK, is this a good question? 20, OMG. All right, OK. OK, so. The answer is actually that you would consider probably all of the above because she's lost a lot of weight. She's not been very compliant. Uh, but what she actually had was she had copper deficiency. Uh, yeah. So this one again here, she did not have neutropenia, but she had that. And oftentimes copper deficiency goes along with B12 deficiency. Copper to keep in mind, um, it comes in through the stomach, it gets reduced, it does require a little bit of an acid environment. It's taken up by the Menke's protein and it competes with zinc. So if you have somebody that ODs on zinc because they think it's great for colds, they can become copper deficient. And the problem is in the, the CNS and the nervous system is that you need copper to maintain myelin sheaths and you also need it for your axons. So that's actually how you develop peripheral neuropathy. And it typically involves, um, you can see here there's a little bit of whiteness here. Now we're not neuroradiologists, so take my word for it. You can see here that there's a little bit of an increase in signal here in the dorsal horn, and you can actually also see, follow the little line, that we have um, changes here right along that part. And if we go back to the history for the patient, she describes some arm pain and back pain. You can imagine she's probably having some paresthesias, in addition to having some weakness and falling, which could be from dorsal motor neuron. Hey, look, we're all neurologists. We do GI, and you put your nutrition hat on, you're a neurologist. <laughs> 